Welcome to our latest instalment in our series, Blueprint for Life. We've already seen how God is the great designer, the architect who has got a blueprint and a plan for his church and for our lives. And how he's provided that to us and communicated that blueprint to us through the scriptures, particularly the New Testament. But imagine, uh, if you will, for a second, there's an architect who's designed an amazing building, this, this beautiful structure that's going to be built and be the marvel of the world. And he hands the blueprints over to uh, a builder, to a master builder. And he says, there, make my vision a reality. And so the master builder begins. And as soon as he's received the blueprint, he thinks, I've no need to communicate with the architect anymore. I've got the blueprint. So when a problem arises or a, a query arises, he just does what he thinks best and there's no communication between architect and builder. The end result is not gonna be perfect. The end result is not gonna be pleasing to the architect. There, there's gonna be many problems and mistakes in the process. And it's for this reason that when we look at the values of the early church, we see that they were devoted to prayer, both corporate prayer and private individual prayer, because they understood this principle that whilst God has communicated a number of values and a number of principles to us for how we should live our lives, we need to be in constant communication with the grand designer. We need to be in constant communication with God so that, it, so that we can know his heart, so that we can ask him questions, so that we can resolve problems, so that we can gain direction. In 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul writes, Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is the will of God that we should pray without ceasing. We should be those who are devoted to prayer, wholly given over to a life of prayer. And that is two main aspects that they would come together and pray corporately, but also they would, in their own lives, pray individually. And the question is why? Why should we pray without ceasing? Why should prayer be such a massive priority in our lives? Prayer shouldn't be uh, an afterthought. It shouldn't be something just confined to a prayer meeting, and it shouldn't be thought of as a duty or an obligation we must fulfill. First of all, we need to recognize that prayer is an incredible privilege. We have access through Christ to God. When Jesus died and he was, when he was crucified, we read that the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two. That barrier through which on, the high priest could only go one day a year was ripped from top to bottom as a sign that we can come into the very presence of God anytime we like because of the great high priest, Jesus Christ. And we need to continually remind ourselves of that enormous privilege. What an awesome, almost indescribable, unthinkable thing it is that we, mere mortals, sinful at that, can actually boldly enter into the presence of the God of this world. Prayer is important also because this God, this creator of everything, this omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being desires to have a relationship with us. And a relationship requires communication. What kind of marriage exists where a husband and wife live in the same house but never talk to one another? They can be present, they can have um, a piece of paper saying they're married, but they don't really have a marriage to speak of. And God's desire is that we are united to him in an intimate relationship, that we can speak to him and that he can speak to us. Prayer is also important because whilst he's provided a blueprint for our lives and our churches, this blueprint focuses on values and on principles. It doesn't focus on systems. It doesn't give us a lot of information on what to do in any given circumstance. So for example, when it comes to churches, uh, there's much in scripture that tells us the values and the principles we need to put in place, but it doesn't tell us what day we should meet, how long we should meet, what songs we should sing. 
The reason for that is God doesn't want us to live by principles and systems and rules and regulations. He wants us to live our lives by relationship and by responding to him and by keeping in step with the spirit, as we're told in Galatians 5. We need to live lives where the spirit guides us and we respond. And the only way we can know really what the spirit is telling us and which way he's steering us is to listen to him. And we need to take time out to seek his voice and to hear what he has to say to us in our lives and in our churches. We need to be a people who remain in Christ. In John chapter 15, Jesus is very clear about this. He said, if you remain in me, if you abide in me, if you come and you rest in my presence, then I will remain in you and you will bear good fruit. If we want to be fruitful in our lives and in our churches, we need to be people who are found in the presence of Jesus. We need to be people who are found in prayer. We need to communicate with him about what he desires for us. We need to come before him in praise and adoration. We need to come before him and confess our sins to him and our failures and our weaknesses. We need to give thanks and we need to bring our requests before him. In Philippians chapter four and verse six, Paul writes this, do not be anxious about anything. And in the days in which we live right now, Many people are anxious about many things. We're uh, anxious about health. We're anxious about our loved ones that we're finding it hard to connect with. Uh, anxious about finances, anxious about uh, so many things. And the news and the media and Facebook and all of these things seem to just amplify fear and anxiety. And in these times more than ever before, perhaps, there's a desperate need for us not to be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And in that, we, we really need to understand that prayer is a two-way thing. It isn't us simply um, reciting phrases and, and, and some kind of spell, some kind of charm, some kind of mantra um, or babbling away. It is a conversation with a God who is alive and hears us. And not only that, but a God who speaks. He is not an idol that is silent, but he is a God who speaks. And a key component of our prayer life is not just that we speak, but that we listen and we take time out to hear what the Lord would say to us. And we need to have faith that he will speak. It's a promise of Jesus where he tells us in John chapter 10 that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And that concept of hearing his voice, uh, I, I'm somebody who's guilty of this. Sometimes my wife can speak and in one sense I'm listening, but I'm not really listening. I'm not really hearing. And sometimes I have to make a conscious effort to actually stop what I'm doing, focus on her and really pay attention to her words and really hear what she's saying. And sometimes in the busyness of life and in, uh, just our own, um, our own minds so racing with so many things, it can be so easy to miss the voice of God and not really hear what he's telling us. Sometimes also, of course, uh, if you're anything like me, you will sometimes have selective deafness and hear only what you want to hear. But we need to be those who are focused on truly hearing the voice of the Lord because that's the only wise way to live. If you know all of the scriptures, if you know all of the principles for life, if you know all of the values, that's great. But those things alone will not bring fruitfulness. It's certainly a better way to live than in direct rebellion to God. But if you want true lasting fruitfulness in life, you need to be somebody found in the presence of God and hearing the voice of God. Now, of course, if you love somebody, you want to spend time with them. If you remember that, that first time you ever fell in love and you would find any excuse to, to be with that person, to talk to that person, to, to communicate with that person. And often that's uh, the case with the Lord as well. We, uh, out of our love and out of our pure devotion, it's something we wanna do. But as with marriage, sometimes if you just neglect 
to actually discipline yourself in certain areas, it can be easy to fall away and to neglect an area of a relationship. And so it often is certainly my experience that I can find myself where my prayer life has been neglected, not because I've fallen out of love, but because I haven't disciplined myself. And it's not a direct contradiction. It's not that if you love something, you don't need discipline. Often it's the opposite, that because you love, you discipline yourself to do that which pleases the one that you love. I want to please the one that I love. And what pleases him is me spending time with him. And so prayer is also something I find I need to discipline myself to do. It's something that where sometimes it's a weak muscle in my life and I find that I have to strengthen that muscle. At first it's difficult and my capacity is, is less. But as I practice that, as I um, stretch that muscle, as I build that muscle, it becomes easier, it becomes a strength, it becomes something I can do better and for longer. And we need to understand that prayer is not a luxury, it's not an optional extra, it is a necessary thing for a healthy relationship with God and an obedient walk with him. Jesus from the moment of his baptism, immediately went into the desert to pray and to fast before he started his ministry. Often throughout his ministry, we read he took himself to a quiet place to pray. We also see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, at his time of greatest temptation and his greatest stress, when, he, when, when the enemy was coming with, with enormous temptation and where Jesus knew what was going to befall him the next day, what did he do? He took his disciples to a quiet place and asked them to pray while he spent time before his father in prayer. Jesus at every key moment of his life prayed. And the incredible thing is, even after he, he rose again and has been uh, lifted into heaven, he is still praying today. In fact, he's interceding for you and for me. We read about that in Romans 8, in verse 34, Paul writes, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And Jesus came primarily to die and pay a sacrifice so that we could have life. But in his whole life, what he did also was model to us what it is to be an obedient and loving son of God. And his example to us is one of prayer constantly. And Jesus did many things that bring us, that cause us to, to just bow down in awe. But most of what he did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit, not through his own innate power, but by submitting himself to his Father and doing only what the Father told him to do. So we see that Jesus did what he did because he was a man of prayer. And if we want to emulate him in love, if we want to em emulate him in power, if we want to emulate him in obedience, we too need to be people of prayer. All of the heroes of the faith were men and women of prayer. One of my favorite stories is that of Daniel, who was in exile in Babylon. And Babylon speaks of the systems of this world, the wisdom of man setting itself up against God and eventually persecuting God. And that's what happened to Daniel, where his enemies set him up and made prayer illegal. And still we see that Daniel prayed three times a day to his God. He was devoted to prayer, even though in that case it cost him being cast into a den of lions and potentially cost him his life. But God delivered him. Whether God delivers us or not from persecution, we like Daniel need to be those who are committed to prayer, no matter what the resistance that we face. Remember that concept of devotion moving forward, even in spite of pressure or resistance. It's something that needs to be at the very core of who we are. But we spoke of discipline and we do need to be disciplined in these things. Some people say, oh, I don't need a quiet time. I don't need a prayer time because I just speak to God, you know, regularly throughout the day. As I'm doing my day, I speak to God all the time. And that's wonderful. But we need, I think, to understand it's not an either or. 
You know, if I say my prayer is limited only to uh, a certain quiet time in the morning, then I'm missing something. But I believe also if I just sporadically talk to God through the day, but I don't set time aside to, to purposely seek him and devote a portion of my day to him, I think we're missing out as well. Just as in a marriage, I hope that I'm faithful in constantly communicating to my wife. But sometimes I have to deliberately set time aside and make time to spend with her, to deliberately communicate with her. And times where we can really communicate deep heart issues in a way that we can't just as we constantly go about life. So I would encourage each and every one of us as we are devoted to prayer to have both of those elements in our lives. But you know, when it comes to having a quiet time, um, many of us struggle, and I think it's a similar struggle as going to the gym. You know, we have the same excuses, you know, I don't have time, um, I don't know how to do it, it's too difficult, all of these things. And I think what we can do is put certain things in place that are very practical to help us develop a more effective prayer life. And I wanna go through some practical steps that may help you um, if this is something that you need to strengthen. It's certainly uh, things that have helped me in the past. And the first thing is ask God to stir up within you a passion and a desire to pray. But not just that, hang out with people who have a passion to pray. Passion is contagious. Hang out with people who are so passionate and so enthusiastic and so excited about prayer that that will catch you and you will become enthusiastic and excited about it as well. Listen to testimonies of answers to prayer. One of the greatest faith builders and one of the greatest things to help uh, increase a desire for something is to listen to what God has done in, in the past and in other people's lives. Don't be overly ambitious. You know, often I read biographies of uh, great heroes of the faith. And, you know, sometimes you, say, you read, you know, that they woke up at 3 a.m. and spent six hours in prayer before the day started. If you're going to wake up tomorrow and say, I'm going to spend six hours in prayer, you're probably dooming yourself to failure. Just as somebody who says, I'm going to start running tomorrow and run a marathon. Start with a smaller goal and build it up and build it up as your capacity increases. Don't set yourself up for failure, but do set time aside. It may mean work, waking up earlier in the morning. It may be, be being more disciplined uh, with your time. One of the things uh, that I read was, Facebook was given to us by God, so none of us can ever claim we didn't have enough time to pray. But make time, set time aside, it is important. And having a regular time helps because routine makes it easier. Have a time that works for you. Getting up earlier can really help us create more time in our schedules, but only if that works. Um, I, I remember being at Bible college and one day a week was set, a set aside for ministry times. And one friend of mine insisted that the team that he ministered with would wake up, must wake up at 5 a.m. and pray together. Uh, and without fail, every Wednesday, five o'clock, he would be there with his team. He would open up in prayer. And as soon as he'd finished his prayer, you would look and he, there would be drool coming out of his mouth and, and he'd fallen asleep. What is the point of waking up at 5 a.m. to pray if you fall asleep at five past five? Find a time that works for you and that really is a time that is productive in prayer. Find a good place, a quiet place, uh, a place that... Um, is not gonna provide distractions, and maybe a place where you really feel connected with God. Uh, for some people, it's the beach. For some people, it's a quiet place in the house. For some people, it's a garden, uh, wherever it is. I find that if I try and pray while I'm in bed, my bed and my duvet win over prayer. So find a place that works for you. And then have a pen and paper or a journal. One of the things that happens with me, the way my mind works is, as soon as I start to pray, all the problems, all the concerns, all the jobs of the day start invading my brain. And I find if I can just write those things down, my brain doesn't have to focus on them. 
I can get on with praying and then come back to that list later. But also a prayer journal is a really useful tool. Keep a record of what you're praying for, what you're praying about, and what God is saying to you. And as you look back on that months later, you will see that God has been speaking, God has been answering prayer, and God has been building something in you. It is a really useful tool to have. Find different ways to pray. Pray through scripture, pray in song, put worship music on. Uh, if you don't know what to say, um, pray in tongues if, if you can pray in tongues. Um, make a prayer list and go through that. Uh, one useful exercise I have, um, I use the acronym, acronym ACTS or ACTS. Um, it stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And so in, in a prayer time, I'll start with adoration, a time of praising God. Then I'll come to him confessing things where I failed, where I'm weak, then a time of thanksgiving, and then supplication or, or request before God. And part of supplication is intercession, praying for other people, praying for the lost, praying for my friends, praying for the sick. And at the moment, there's no shortage of sick people to pray for as COVID is, is ravaging um, uh, many places and, and we're hearing of many sick people. It's also useful to find a prayer partner, somebody who you can pray with, who can help you, who can guide you, who can train you, and who can encourage you in this wonderful, wonderful thing that has been given to us as a gift by God. And then finally, I would say this, learn to listen. Open your spiritual ears and hear what God is saying. In the book of Revelation, there are, there are seven letters written to the churches and the constant uh, refrain there is, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And we have been given spiritual ears to hear what the Lord is saying. When Jesus was on the earth, he came to the temple one day and there were money lenders everywhere. And he, he was so angry that he, he formed a whip and he, he turned over tables and he flogged people and he drove them out of the temple. And his refrain was, my house shall be called a house of prayer. We as the church are the house of God. And each of us is called the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Lord desires that his house, that your life, that the body that he's joined you to would be a house of prayer. Let us be a people stirred up with a faith and an excitement and a passion to spend time talking to and listening to the God who has saved us, the God who has designed our lives and the God who has the blueprint and the master plan. Let us be those who are in constant communication with this grand designer that our lives would be fruitful, successful, and that we would become more like him because we do become like those we spend time with and that our relationship with him would grow ever deeper, ever more intimate and ever more fruitful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have opened the way for us to come into your presence by sending your son to die. And I pray that we would never take that for granted. That entering into your presence is a privilege that we would always marvel at and wonder at, but we would always be enthusiastic to engage in. That we can come into your presence, whether we've failed, sinned, no matter how, what our feeling, whether we're tired, whether we've succeeded, Whatever it is, we can come into your presence and we can find you and we can find your mercy and your grace and we can lay our requests before you. We can praise you and adore you. And what I marvel at most is that's a place where we can hear you and you can speak into our hearts, you can speak into our lives, guide us, encourage us and just embrace us with your love let us be a people found in that place found publicly and privately as a people of prayer in the name of jesus amen we're now going to 
hear an amazing testimony of somebody who can really share what it means to see God answer prayer. But before we do, I want to say this. If you're somebody who's really battling and really struggling in this area of prayer, why don't you get hold of us? We would love to encourage you and help you and see you come into an area of fruitfulness in this area of your life. So that Thursday, I was busy setting up sound for the 412 Youth Leaders Gathering. After I was done setting up, a friend of mine phoned and he asked me to come over to his place in Durbanville. So naturally I went over to his house and, and we chilled and everything. And then once I left there I went to go fill up the fuel and that's the last thing I can remember of that night. I was involved in a motorcycle accident where I had collided with a car. I hit the front of the car um, and the bike ended up splitting in two pieces. The front of the bike came off and the back of the bike was left behind. Um, my handlebars had ended up down the road and the bike had ended up in a different position and I'm not entirely sure what happened to myself. When I look at the, the damage that was done to the bike and the damage that was dealt to the car, um, there's no ways I should have survived, like absolutely no ways. Um, I came out of the, the accident with a broken scapula, um, a brain hemorrhage, swelling on the brain, obviously from the brain hemorrhage, and um, a, two broken ribs, two collapsed lungs, and a broken metatarsal. They then put me into induced coma um, because of the brain swelling. And that's the start of the testimony of what the church and God has done in me. For two days, um, the doctors couldn't tell my, my family like if I was gonna survive or not. So I was in, in that induced coma for two days. And in that time, the church prayed for me. The church has a, a WhatsApp group um, for prayer and while I was in this induced coma the, the message went around saying that they don't know what the extent of the injuries are going to be and they don't know if I'm going to make it. The church then came together and prayed for me, this is my local congregation that came and um, then later that night they also prayed for me at the youth leaders equipped evening and I believe that it's only through the church's prayers and God going our people have prayed, so I will save you. Praying and just interceding and just, just asking God for healing, I believe that I was healed and that I've come out with minimal injuries where it could have been much worse. Like, I believe that God saved me that night and through the church, praying, um, like, yeah, God just brought a miracle through. I'd woken up on the Saturday evening not knowing where I am and just knowing that something had happened. And a cool testimony out of this is that I woke up with two thoughts on my mind and they weren't mine. They were just sitting there and I knew it was the Lord. And all they were is God is good and I love my mom. So um, yeah, I, I had no fear when I woke up on the table and I, I I imagine that it's only the, the love of God going through me and keeping me calm. So yeah, I spent a week in, a week in the hospital and the, the church had just rallied around my family and just come together and just, just supported everyone. And they came together, they gave food, they gave love, like for days on end. Like I wasn't even at home and, and my mom was receiving food parcels and food every night. I, I grew up most of my life with, with just living with my mother because my father passed away when I was, when I was 12. And um, when I came out of the coma and I heard that, that the church was looking after my mom because that was a big point and where I was worried, it was just such a relief and just it was so cool to just see that the church had come and just like supported her in, in everything that they could do for her. People just came together and they prayed and they prayed and they just went through it for me. Every time I meet someone, 
they're always like, yes, sir, we prayed so hard for you and like we interceded for you and God pulled through. And you can, you can actually physically see how prayer works and how prayer, like it, it happens. Like God listens and God hears what you ask for. And if it's in his will, he'll do it. Like I still, I still haven't received full healing in my arm. Like my shoulder doesn't work and my tricep doesn't work at the moment. But I still have faith that God will heal me and that even if he doesn't, it's not going to change the way I look at him and the way, the way I've seen his love work and I've seen what he's done for me. Just, just seeing what the church has done for me and done for my family, it's, it's given me more of a love for the people in the church and made me want to put myself more in the church and do more in the church. And yeah, just put myself where I can and where God wants me to be. And when I think of the two thoughts that I had in my head when I woke up, that God is good and I love my mom, like my, even if I don't get healed, my thoughts on that hasn't changed. And God will always be good. And I know this because of what I've experienced.